Frank Pucelik is here in um, the NVNLP Congress Day. It is 2015, and, uh, and I'm Angelique, and I have the privilege to interview you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, today we had already an interesting day with you, Frank. And uh, so I am already flabbergasted uh, uh, about how you are, you know, how you kept yourself hidden all the time. Because you have so much to, to say about original NLP stuff. And uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, the period you were not for us, you were invisible to us. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me something about that time? Well, I actually, I continued after, I, I know I left Santa Cruz in 77. Mm -hmm. uh, spent a year in Nebraska, kind of reorienting myself, then moved to San Diego in 79. I opened uh, Meta Institute in 79, brought five of the original research team to San Diego with me. So we just basically operated in San Diego, did training groups and and you know and, and did experiments and more sort of experiments on patterns and seeing what we could figure out or find. So after that I moved to Oklahoma. I did that until 81. One actually, yeah. And then I moved to Oklahoma. And I moved to Meta Institute to Oklahoma. And actually, that was when I started Meta International. And um, I worked in Oklahoma all through the Midwestern United States, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas, in that area. Taught NLP, taught whatever, just never got on the international level. And um, then when I moved to Russia, I did the same thing. I basically stayed local. Yeah, and, and obviously you, you say uh, Meta, the Meta, uh, everything is Meta, because Meta was originally the name of NLP. Yeah. Of NLP, and you even now want to talk about Meta rather than about NLP. Mm -hmm. And you did all the Meta things, because in the original years, the start, you were, you were experimenting and all. Could you tell us something about that, the, the years before you left? We had uh, six great years, from uh, early 71 until kind of the beginning of 77. Yeah, because you told us that today in this room, mm -hmm. how it all went. You were already with Richard busy doing Yeah, Richard Gestalt. and I were teaching Gestalt at the University of California in mm -hmm. 71. And that's about the time that a new linguistics professor showed up named Grinder. And uh, after six, eight months of him being there and, and Richard basically asking him to come and observe our work to see if there was something else we could, could find, something else we could figure out, uh, John finally agreed to come. He observed, he watched, and over the period of six months or so, um, we became a threesome. We kind of got together and we started re recognizing that we were talking about some things that were really interesting and important. Um, little by little graduate students joined the conversations at first and then we realized after another six months or so that we actually had a group that was basically studying the patterns of different great... Actually in the beginning we were more studying the, th the patterns to make the modeling skills, the modeling meta model rep systems and so forth. And it was kind of after we had some of those models built, and maybe in 72, even into early 73, that we started going out to use the models to measure the skills of some of the top professionals that we could find, Virginia, Milton, and so forth. Milton was later, but we started with Fritz because we had access. Yeah. And then uh, Bob Spitzer knew Virginia, so he arranged access to Virginia. Um, Bob Spitzer owned the land that we, that were, yeah, actually John lived there for a while, Richard lived there for a while, I never lived there, but I spent a lot of time there, and Richard lived there when he was working as a warehouseman for Science of Behavior books. It's Basically, I think that prop property was, was purchased by Science of Behavior books. I see. Used to be used as a warehousing and shipping facility. I, maybe, I don't know why Bob bought that land, but it was beautiful land, maybe he bought it to end up retiring there or something, I don't know. But it had two or three houses on it. Um, they built a geodesic dome, which was the, the warehouse for science and behavior books was a dome. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Richard lived there and for a long time, and then John moved there later, and then um, 
we use that as a base. Gregory moved there later. Um, Spitzer gave Bre Gregory what we call the big house. Yeah, and, and, and but you were talking about the, um, the warehouse actually, um, referring also to Bender, finding stuff there and acting like uh, Fritz Perls. Yeah, he, yeah. He, th there were some manuscripts and tapes and so forth that as far as I understand were at the warehouse. And Richard was playing with him, watching him and whatever. And when Spitzer would come up, sometimes Richard would act like Fritz, which um, surprised Bob. And I think that's when he decided to give Richard the, the material, access to the, all of the material, told him that there was pieces of a book written that Fritz had started and never finished, and asked Richard if he wanted to, to go ahead and watch the tapes and, and, and look at the manuscripts and finish the book. And Richard did finish the book. And it was a shock of all shocks. It was great. It was really good. Richard did an incredibly good job on that book. Uh, kind of, uh, honestly, surprised the hell out of me. So, because, uh, you know, he was a warehouse guy. Yeah. So he was uh, actually very clever or smart or, you know. He sure did a hell of a, jo a good job yeah. with that book. I'll yes, tell you that. Absolutely. So anyway, since uh, Professor John Grinder came yeah, joined the team, as it were, made mm -hmm. the trisom. Is that's where the patterning, where he was a linguistic. So mm -hmm. he, he um, where you were wondering what you were doing, probably like what, what what's working. How yeah, we we were doing Gestalt, and we were doing pretty good in training students. And Richard and I were both very good at doing Gestalt. We just didn't know what we were doing. Yes. And you know, like most other people who copy the greats, yeah. and then you learn some things by accident, and you go do them, and some things you never learn, but you kind of exactly. do with what you learn. Yeah, and to to give it to us also, because since it, mm. the patterning became clear, of course, you could yeah. obviously give it to the world. Yeah, well, we, that was kind of later when we decided to do something like that. Mm -hmm. But in the original days, we were giving it to each other. Yes, because we never had any intention of. Of going anyplace else with that it. wasn't in your mind, right? No, it, well, we were answering questions for ourselves and playing and having a lot of fun and and learning some stuff. Then, when the other graduate students started joining us, then it got more a little bit more formal, but still basically playful and yeah. sarcastic and all Ex the other things. Yeah, that we sarcastic did. is the word too. Yeah, yeah. I, we I were kind of we were kind of rebels, and you know, at least John and Richard and I were, and and the students that were with us, they were incredibly well-educated, incredibly smart, incredibly perceptive, and you know, I don't know how John and Richard feel. I know how I feel, and that's maybe that's because I was part of both groups. Mm -hmm. John and Richard and I were together, and at the same time, I was together with the, with the teams. And, and the, the teams would experiment with ideas that John and Richard and I, mostly John and Richard, would come up with. I don't want to take credit for those. A lot of that, I didn't do that. The meta group you were referring yeah, to. The, the yeah, the meta group was yeah. the team. Yes. And and John and Richard and I would get together and figure out from reading or from from John and Richard were both really really good at going through the research, John especially, like hemisphere function research and so forth, and saying you know this looks like we should be able to do this. Frank, take these patterns and go see if they work. So you take this material and go tell the kids that we know how to do this and see if they can do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would go and say, John and Richard and I already, already figured this out. Yes, you were, t you were turning you know, that around, yes. You know, yeah. and, and we're interested to see if you can figure out the same thing we did. Exactly. You know, and so they did. Yeah. And then I'd go back and go, oh my God, it works, we can do this, we can do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, so which was kind of fun, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, the kids just were tremendous. And you know, at a moot point at some point when you have 14 or 15 dynamic people working inside out, month after month, week after week, hour after hour, day after day, again and again and again. It's kind of silly to say who who was responsible for this or who was responsible yeah. for that it's because it was kind of impossible to tell. Yeah. You know, there were some things that, that, that I think I discovered, but, you know, because but the setup was there, the tools were there, the experience was there, and... You know, and I think at a certain point, orangutan could have discovered this stuff. But, but you know, there sort were some things that, that that I was real thrilled about. Mm -hmm. um, I made some things work that are not supposed to work. Uh, and, uh, can you give an example? Because it well, sounds that, very gener generative. Uh, well, work, for example, of um, we tried to do DST parts therapy in trance. Yeah. Okay. Well, those two don't go together. 
The one's a conscious oriented yes. process that requires feedback and participation, and the other is an unconsciously oriented process yeah. where there is very little participation other than internally with very minimal cues. And so, and so, and, and it wasn't, it was, was clear to us that the, at, at the unconscious level, basically it's one functioning unit, not parts. So, can you do parts therapy at the unconscious level while a person is in trance? You know, and the answer was simply, Nobody knows, and nobody's done it. You know, well, I went in and did it with a group of about five people and was able to get enough feedback from them non-verbally while they're like this yeah. to recognize that the parts were actually interacting, the parts were learning from each other, and I basically had to go along with a non-verbal feedback with my directions, mm -hmm. but I knew the parts model well enough that I could take very subtle cues and understand where that fit in the model. Okay. So then I could using induction techniques I could or utilization techniques, I could basically then move the model along and watch for feedback to see if it worked. And, and it worked. And then afterwards, the feedback I got from the, the clients was incredible changes, incredible internal experiences, and so forth. So as far as I know, I was the first person in history to mix a conscious form that required participation in an unconscious form that didn't and to do parts therapy in trance. Exciting. And, I mean, and to, that was fun. Yeah. You know, and nobody that I knew of had ever done that, ever. No. no. So, so excitement, fun, I mean all, when you read the book today, the book uh, um, was, was free for us to see in, in the Dutch translation, so origins of NLP uh, in, in Dutch is uh, at heart van NLP. But you can see the fun coming from it, yeah, all the right. stories and uh, all the experiences, right. but also lots and lots of hard work and, and exercises, but done with, with, with spirit, with, uh, with power. Yeah, we, we were excited, we were happy, we were inventing things and learning things that nobody had ever learned and yeah. invented. Yeah. And, and for us, it was simply the fun and the challenge and what can we do next? Yeah. You know, and, and okay, wait a minute, but when, maybe this will work or maybe that will work. How about, can we do this? Can we do that? Nobody knows because no. nobody's done it. So let's do it and see what happens. Yeah, see so very works. adventurous too, right? Um, in yeah, a way. We, we were, we had kind of not many boundaries. No, so. oh, <laughs> yeah. but you, you told us also <laughs> all coming back many from Many more ways than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, but somehow uh, during this day it, it became clear to me that you took that state of mind with you to your work which you are doing now. I mean, I hear your invitation to all of us to, you know, sort of participate in what you expect to, to, to go on in, in Ukraine with the war and all going on. But you have the sa same state of mind somehow, um, it appears to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean, but as far as I'm concerned, there's a need, there's a, there's a situation, and I know how to do it. And I live in that country, so mm. I'm obligated to step in and do what I know how to do. Yes, and, and of course, I, I was very vague in, uh, in my word, <laughs> choice of words. But what I meant to say is that adventurous uh, is maybe different now because you know what to do. But you still um, are very um, creative in thinking. Like, we, want, we need to do that, so we'll do that, w which has never been done before, too. You're inviting... If, if we yeah. accomplish this task yes. in the Ukraine, that will be the first time that a That's country I mean. has been able to yeah. avert a disaster. And the, 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 the tragic part and the important part is that in the Ukraine, the potential disaster is far worse than it's ever been in any other country. Mm. So it's already incredibly damaged America. It's damaged England. It's damaged France. It's damaged most of the Arab world. And now coming in Ukraine is a situation that is far more potentially damaging to the country, including the possible dissolution of the country totally. Yeah. And that's coming. Yes. Unless we figure out how to stop it. And, and for me, that simply means that it's time to go to work. Yeah. You know, and, and I, have, I have no doubt in my mind that I can stop this disaster. Yeah. No. So, so ac exactly, and uh, as you have no doubt in your mind to stop, you know, addiction, which you did a very 
impressive job of too. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Using thank using you. NLP for that. Using NLP, yeah. using five different models that nobody had ever put together. No. And it just, you know, it, it, I think I came out of all these years of NLP and the years of war and all that bit simply with the understanding that that if something needs to happen, I can figure out how to do it. Yeah. It's not, it's just a matter of sit down, take the facts, take the goal, think of the steps, what do you need, what do you, what's going to do this, what's going to do that. And if something's missing, I call somebody that's a friend of mine who who I think knows how to do something like that. I ask them how to do that. They tell me how to do it, then I do it, and then I add that. And then, so, but, but the question is never, and the question is never, are we going to get to the goal? The question is, how? Is how. Yes, how do we get to the goal? Yeah. So this is the, the, the mindset and, uh, that we learned from you today during all day. And um, that's where I wanted to, to, to close this interview with. That, uh, that's a mindset for us to copy. It's... Uh, it has been lovely to watch you. your work here and uh, thank you. That's very things. nice of you. Thank you, and it's an incredible pleasure for me to be with you guys. Thank and, you so uh, much. Yes. Thank you. Everything you do.